Hello and welcome and thanks for tuning in. You're watching Gravitas. My name is Priyanka Sharma. Let's take a look at our lineup for tonight. The rich and elite are leaving China in big numbers and they're taking their big money with them. Why? Because China is not their country of choice anymore to live, to prosper, to do business or even to exercise free will. They'd rather move to safer havens, be it Canada or Singapore. And one man is to blame, Xi Jinping. His regressive policies are pushing the wealthy out of the country from the zero COVID nightmare to Xi's clamp down on big tech and his own insecurities with business magnets. Equity markets are now in free fall and it's causing the wealthy to pull the trigger on exit plans. On Gravitas tonight, I'll tell you why China is no longer an attractive destination for the wealthy. I'll tell you why pessimism is now building over the future of the world's second largest economy. I'll tell you how poor governance and repressive policies have ended the era of Get Rich First in China. Also on the show, a new bill in the US could ban TikTok in the country. The app, of course, is famous globally for its short video viral content, but more so as China's soft power. So why is the US banning TikTok now? Is it playing catch up with India? We'll discuss. The US Securities and Exchange Commission has charged eight social media influencers for plotting stock manipulation. The influencers schemed an investment fraud on $100 million. That's no chum change. Should influencers be allowed to influence your investments? And it's a season of strikes in the United Kingdom. We're seeing nurses take to the streets in the biggest NHS strike in history. What will happen to the patients? Does the UK government have a plan in place to tackle the rising discontent? We'll find out on the show tonight. A mass exodus is underway in China. An exodus of the rich and the wealthy. They're fleeing the country en masse. Seeking asylum in democratic nations. But the question is why? Why do they want to leave? And the answer is Xi Jinping. His repressive policies have impelled this exodus. His crackdown on millionaires. His clampdown on free speech. His repression of protests. And of course, his draconian pursuit of those who have created the Chinese economic boom in the first place in the past two decades. This is forcing people to leave, making them shift to safe havens. I'll start with some numbers. Since 2012, more than 600,000 Chinese citizens have sought asylum overseas. 600,000. Out of this, more than 100,000 asylum applications were filed in 2020 alone. And in 2022, this year, more than 10,000 high net worth individuals from China said they wanted to leave the country along with their money. The next big question, where are they going? Which countries are they relocating to? According to one report, the most popular destinations are the US, Singapore, Australia and Canada. Let me show you some reports now. This one's from the 11th of December. It says that Canada is witness, witnessing a spike in emigration of Chinese nationals. This year, there was a 15% rise in applications from Chinese nationals. 
Canada's Department of Immigration and Citizenship apparently received more than 9,925 applications and they were all for permanent residency. Look at this report now. It says that after Xi Jinping's re-election as president, online searches for ways to leave China have exploded. Last month, more than 60 million people searched for information on WeChat. A week later, when another COVID-19 wave hit the country, the number of searches for leaving rose to 80 million in one day, 8-0. Another report says that the rich Chinese worth over $48 billion want to leave. Meaning, they want to leave China with their wealth worth $48 billion. If this happens, this will be the second largest wealth outflow for any country. Russia is number one on this list. And now China will come second. And then we have this report. It came out earlier today. It says, COVID-weary Chinese millionaires are eyeing Singapore for relocation. Yes, Singapore is now becoming a magnet for China's rich and wealthy who want to flee the zero COVID mess. What do all these developments tell you? That Xi Jinping's policies have failed. There is a deep sense of discontent running through Chinese society as of now, not just in the lower strata, but also among the rich and the elite. You see, they want to feel a sense of safety and security, a sense of normalcy, a sense of belonging. Unfortunately, they don't feel any of this in Xi Jinping's China. There are many reasons behind this. To start with, there's zero COVID. These restrictions have upended daily life. They have imposed an abnormal life on the people of China. It's a story we've covered repeatedly on the show. The crackdown on protests, it has further fueled fears in the public. People have started worrying about their future in the country, whether they will ever be able to live normally again. They've started perceiving zero COVID as a tool to not just stop the virus, but to control the society. The second reason is a worsening credit crisis. Companies are defaulting on their debt, especially in the real estate sector. The Chinese government is reluctant to help distressed firms. Reason number three is China's crackdown on the wealthy. Since last year, Xi Jinping has pushed for what he calls common prosperity. The objective of this is to redistribute China's wealth and narrow down the country's growing wealth gap. Naturally, for the rich, that is bad news. Because they are worried about losing their fortunes. These fears are not unwarranted. Just look at what China is doing. Under the goal of common prosperity, prominent chief executives have been forced to step down. Two of them, Wu Yajun and Pan Shi, have resigned in recent months. A similar trend was seen in the tech sector too. Richard Liu of JD.com, Zhang Yiming of ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, Su Hua of Kwaishu, and Jack Ma of the ANT Group, they all left their positions. Their exit happened after the Chinese state began a crackdown to rein in its people. The charges against them are appalling. Take the case of Sun Dawu, an agricultural mogul. He has been put behind bars. His crime? Gathering a crowd to attack state organs, obstructing government administration, and picking quarrels and provoking trouble. These are the charges. They're used often by the Chinese state to go after any and every critic. Sun was an outspoken supporter and a friend of Chinese political dissidents. He has been punished with an 18-year-long prison term. And why just the billionaires? In the eight years that he has been in power, Xi Jinping has ordered a sweeping crackdown on everybody. Activists, journalists, lawmakers, celebrities, minorities, dissenters. No organ of the Chinese state has been left untouched by the president's purge. It doesn't matter who you are, a citizen, a billionaire or a lawmaker. The state will put you behind bars in Xi Jinping's China at his whim. So it shouldn't come as a surprise then that Chinese citizens are leaving their country in droves.
Now, staying with China, let's talk about its soft power, TikTok. Is TikTok a Chinese surveillance system? Is TikTok spying on you, trying to control your mobile phones? The United States is now trying to ban the Chinese video sharing app. American leaders are convinced that the Chinese app must be deleted and banned for good. A bill has already been passed in the U.S. Senate by a voice vote. It bars federal employees from using TikTok on government devices. It's only a matter of time before the ban gets an odd from the House of Representatives and gets U.S. President Joe Biden's signature. Will that, will that be the start of the end of TikTok? I don't know how many of you are familiar with this notorious app story, its history. Let's rewind. China exported TikTok in 2017. Soon it brought Musical.ly and transferred its 100 million users to TikTok. TikTok's growth has been unmatched ever since. It is the world's most downloaded mobile app since 2020. It has more than a billion users worldwide. In fact, in 2012, Android phone users alone spent 16.2 trillion minutes, trillion minutes on TikTok. Let that sink in. You know, there is a reason why TikTok clicks with a young audience globally. This app turns average videos into uber cool films and unknown people into celebrities, overnight sensations, or even influencers. Also, TikTok is easy to watch. But is this a rat trap? Was TikTok a net thrown by China to hook youngsters and steal their data? TikTok is dangerous and I'm not even getting into the deadly trends or inappropriate content cyber bullying tonight let's just stick to the problem of data breach and spying you see as you spend sleepless nights on TikTok scrolling through the app during work hours you must ask is your browsing pattern and your data falling into the wrong hands chances are high very high you see, Chinese law mandates the breach of private data, ByteDance and all other Chinese tech companies are required to share their information with the Communist Party of China. It is compulsory. Which explains why India did what it did. TikTok was banned from India in 2020. India was TikTok's largest market. And now, the doors to this market are forever closed for this video sharing app. Two years and a few more months later, America is trying to play catch-up. The app has more than 100 million users in America. Several American states have already banned TikTok in government devices. Maryland is the latest. What were America's concerns? A threat to national security, same as India. In June this year, BuzzFeed reported that ByteDance had access to U.S. consumer data. The next month, the director of America's Federal Bureau of Investigation said that Chinese espionage is the greatest long-term threat to America's economic vitality. Earlier this year, audio files were leaked from TikTok's internal meetings. What came out of these files surprised no one. A member of TikTok's Trust and Safety Department was heard saying, and I'm quoting, everything is seen in China. Think about that statement. Then there was a director who was heard referring to a master admin, someone who is based in Beijing. The director went on to say that the master admin, quote unquote, has access to everything. Then something happened last month. The head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation said that China could be using TikTok to influence the app's user. That's a scary thought. Worse, China could possibly be using TikTok to control the user's electronics. And the result is this, this bill. There isn't much that Republicans and Democrats agree on these days, but China and Chinese surveillance somehow always manage to find bipartisan support. Good for America, not so much for TikTok or its parent company, ByteDance. So what has TikTok said? It has called the ban politically motivated, adding that the move will quote-unquote do nothing to advance the national security of the United States. For years, TikTok has refused claims of a data breach. 
It maintains that data of American users is stored in America. The information is not passed on to the Chinese Communist Party, but that's a story the world is increasingly facing trouble believing. The world seems to be finally fed up of TikTok, and that's not good news for China. You see, TikTok is the first consumer-facing app from China to take off at such a big global scale. For Beijing, TikTok means pride. For the world outside China, TikTok means threat. In 2021, an investigation was launched in Ireland, which was aimed at looking into the transfer of personal data to China. Earlier this year, the UK Parliament woke up to the threat of TikTok. It shut down its TikTok account. British legislators said, and I quote, data security risks associated with the app are considerable, adding that the data of the 18 million British TikTok users is routinely transferred to China. Another scary thought. Earlier this year, a US-Australian cybersecurity firm published a report on TikTok. It said the app's data collection was overly intrusive. No surprises there. The report went on to say that the app is connected to a server in mainland China. At least four countries have currently banned, restricted or censored TikTok in some form. What about the rest? Why are countries worldwide allowing a Chinese spyware masquerading as a video sharing app to spy on their citizens? Well, one hopes that the American bill will begin the end of TikTok. It's no secret. Influencers have a great hold on social media platforms. They can convince you to buy a certain product or hop onto the latest trend. But it seems their influence has now gotten a little out of hand, put mildly. It has entered the stock market. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has charged eight social media influencers for plotting stock manipulation. The influencers schemed an investment fraud of $100 million. How did they do this? Well, using the pump and dump scheme. Let me explain. Seven of the charge influencers promoted themselves as successful traders. And the eighth one gave them a platform to flaunt their expertise. First, they set up the groundwork. This included cultivating hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter and in stock trading. Chat rooms on Discord. Discord is a voice, video and text chat app used by tens of millions of people to talk to their friends and communities. So together, the influencers have more than 2 million followers across platforms. And then came the manipulation. The influencers allegedly bought certain stocks. They regularly posted photos of their wealth and repeatedly fed their followers a steady diet of misinformation. They manipulated their followers to buy those selected stocks to pump the prices. This was done quite subtly, but consistently. The influencers posted price targets or indicated that they were buying, holding or adding to their stock positions. You know how social media influencing works. You create hysteria around a product. You talk about its many virtues and convince your loyal tribe to buy it or in this case invest in it. And you milk the profits. One of the influencers hosted a podcast. He invited other individuals to co-host he proactively promoted many of them as expert traders, providing them with a forum for their manipulative statements. The scheme started to work. Share prices and trading volumes for their promoted shares started rising. And when that happened, they regularly sold their shares without disclosing it to their followers. Unethical. They promoted those shares on social media and dumped them in secret. Again, unethical. The U.S. SEC is now seeking permanent injunctions and civil penalties against these influencers. They also face charges of disgorgement and pre-judgment interest. However, surprising as it might be, it isn't anything new. Social media can play a major role in influencing the stock market. Shares of a company can gain viral popularity due to heightened social sentiment on the Internet. There is even a term for it. I'm talking about meme stocks. 
Online communities dedicate heavy research and resources surrounding these talks. They are heavily discussed and analyzed on discussion threads on websites like Reddit. They are posted on platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Take the case, the take the case of GameStop. It is widely regarded as the first meme stock. Its price rose by a hundred times over the course of several months. In August of 2020, the YouTube persona Roaring Kitty posted a video that eventually went viral. In the video, he laid out why shares of game retailer GameStop could soar from five dollars to fifty dollars per share. In January 2021, what Roaring Kitty had suggested took place in earnest. The price of these shares exploded to nearly five hundred dollars amid a frenzy of panic buying. Popular investing app Robinhood became the focus of a controversy when it made the surprising move to restrict buying GameStop. It cited issues with volatile stock and regulatory requirements. Meme stock shareholders are often an unorganized set of individuals. They have their own investment views and preferences. But where exactly do we draw the line? Many believe that meme stock communities coordinate efforts to influence the prices of those shares. The culture of application-based content is on the rise. Popular influencers promote a particular asset without a proper license to do so. Take cryptocurrency for example. Do these images ring a bell? Celebrity influencers like Kim Kardashian have made millions of dollars endorsing dubious crypto investments. Crypto entrepreneurs even hire influencers to push up the value of their digital currencies. Dogecoin, which was of course a meme-based joke currency, turned into one of the most valuable crypto investments overnight. You know how that happened. While social media can provide many benefits for investors, it also presents opportunities for fraudsters like these charge influencers. There is a lack of guidelines to stop such activities on social media. So what's India doing about it? For starters, the Securities and Exchange Board of India recently curbed WhatsApp groups and Telegram channels. These platforms were being used by unauthorized entities for sharing trading advice with investors. It is also working on guidelines to regulate financial influencers on various social media platforms. This includes YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. If you also refer to social media for investment information, you should be careful. It is extremely important to verify how authentic the source of information is. A few telling signs of fraudsters: unsolicited investment information or offers. Fraudsters look for people who are new to investment. They may bombard you with unsolicited information through tweets, posts, or even direct messages (DMs). These influencers can also pressure you to buy or sell a specific share right away, but do not fall prey to such manipulation. Take the time to research, research the stock before you invest in it. Another red flag: no license. Federal and state securities laws require investment professionals to be licensed. You can't just influence people without a license. And social media influencers rarely qualify for this criteria. So watch out, and be very careful of the influencers you follow. While they may take a share of the profits, you could be staring at a big loss. Let me now ask you a question: Is the United Nations facing a crisis of credibility? Has it become a bureaucratic behemoth that bends to the biggest sponsors? I ask this because the UN is being held hostage by a few countries. who are misusing their disproportionate powers to suit their own political interests to influence the body's decision making and to provide a cover to their allies so is it finally time that we reform the united nations and make it deliver on its goals well it certainly seems so and guess who's leading the call to get this done india speaking at the un on wednesday india's external affairs minister s jay shankar called for sweeping reform at the un reform that will make the body functional yet again reform that will make the body credible again we'll get there in a bit first some context 
Jay Shankar made this pitch during a session on counter-terrorism at the United Nations Security Council, a session that is also being attended by Pakistan. Yes, a terror state is part of a session on counter-terrorism. And if you think that's ironic, then you must look at what it is doing at the session. On Tuesday, Pakistan's foreign minister and part-time enunciation coach, Bilawal Bhutto, raked up the Kashmir issue yet again during his speech at the session. We're hardly surprised. How can Pakistan attend a UNSE session and not talk about its favorite obsession? So India decided to counter Pakistan with some facts. In a stinging speech, Jay Shankar said that a country which provided refuge to Osama bin Laden, a country which launched a terror attack on the Indian parliament, has no right or credentials to sermonize, US, to sermonize UN member nations. Listen to this. Excellencies, uh, before I call on the next speaker, uh, allow me to say a few words in my national capacity. Uh, we are obviously focused today on the urgency of reforming multilateralism. We will naturally have our particular views, but there is an ongoing convergence at least that this cannot be delayed any further. The credibility of the UN depends on its effective response to the key challenges of our times, be it pandemics, climate change, conflicts, or terrorism. While we search for the best solutions, what our discourse must never accept is the normalization of such threats. The question of justifying what the world regards as unacceptable should not even arise. That certainly applies to state sponsorship of cross-border terrorism. Nor can hosting Osama bin Laden and attacking a neighboring parliament serve as credentials to sermonize before this council. Jay Shankar's message was simple. You can't be sponsoring terror on one end and talking about human rights on the other. You can't be hosting dreaded terrorists and portray yourself as a victim of their doing. We hope Islamabad is able to comprehend this message. Next, Jay Shankar took aim at China, a country that holds the veto power at the UN and uses it to shield Pakistan for its role in breeding terror. In a veiled reference, he said, and I quote, on the challenge of terrorism, even as the world is coming together with a more collective response, multilateral platforms are being misused to justify and protect perpetrators. What exactly was he referring to? China's repeated holes and blocks on proposals, to, on proposals to blacklist terrorists, especially those based on Pakistani soil. Case in point, Masood Azhar, the chief of jaish e Mohammed. Every time India brings a resolution or proposal to blacklist this man, China comes to Pakistan's rescue. It places a technical hold on the proposal. I can recall at least four instances when it has done so. Once in 2016, then in 2017, and once more in 2019. This only highlights the prevailing inequities at the UN, where one country with a veto power can take a decision which affects millions. Jay Shankar used this as the pretext of his argument when he called for reform during his speech. He said the world needs to have an honest conversation on the effectiveness of multilateral institutions. He said that all members of such institutions should have a credible role in the decision-making process. They can't just function at the whim of a few global powers. Listen to this. We not only need to increase stakeholdership, but also enhance the effectiveness and credibility of multilateralism in the eyes of the international community and in the eyes of global public opinion. That is the purpose of NOPS. Excellencies, if this is to happen, member states from Latin America, Africa, Asia, and small island developing states should have credible and continuing representation in the Security Council. Decisions about the future can no longer be taken without their participation. Now here's the thing. Five countries enjoy disproportionate power at the UN. The United States, the United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia. They all have the power of the veto, a power which each one of them has misused. 
Britain and France misuse the veto against Egypt during the Suez crisis. Russia uses the veto against all resolutions condemning Syria. Any resolution against Israel is consistently vetoed by the US. And China uses the veto to block India's bid to ban Pakistani terrorists. My point is simple. It's been seven decades since the Second World War and only the so-called victors of the war possess the power of veto along with China. How is this even fair? Why can't countries like Japan, South Africa and India have the right to veto? Let me now give you a debrief on India's contribution at the UN. More than 200,000 Indians have served in 49 of the 71 UN peacekeeping missions since 1948. 160 Indians have lost their lives serving under the UN flag. India is the fourth highest troop contributing country at the UN. A total 6,700 Indian troops are deployed for UN peacekeeping missions. And in 2007, India became the first country to deploy an all-women contingent to a UN peacekeeping mission. So I ask again, how long can India and the rest of the UN members be expected to follow the decision of the P5 nations? The bottom line is this, if the United Nations wants to stay relevant, if it wants to be the collective voice of the world, then it must ensure equitable representation of all member states. It must increase stakeholdership in its decision-making process. Five nations, just five nations, cannot be taking all the calls. Right, let's move on now. Our next story is from the United Kingdom. You must have seen the visuals coming in through the day. The world, the rest of the world is bracing for the holiday season. The UK is bracing, bracing itself for a season of strikes. It seems to have become the norm. Every year around this time, unions in the UK go on a strike. But this time, things look different. Thanks to the nurses at the NHS. More than 100,000 of them have hit the streets to demand a pay hike and better working conditions. They're calling it the largest NHS strike in history. Take a look at this next detailed report. We care. 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 These images are from London. What, do we want? what you see are National Health Service nurses staging a protest over their salaries. They want the government to increase their pay by 19% and provide them with better working conditions. This is no ordinary protest. It's the largest in history. Look at the numbers. Over 100,000 nurses are protesting. They represent at least 76 hospitals. The walkout has left them empty. Reports say over 70,000 appointments, procedures and surgeries have been cancelled due to this. These are big numbers. But the nurses say these numbers are pale in comparison to what they're earning. I mean, it's, it hasn't been an easy choice. Uh, you enter uh, the nursing profession um, because you want to help people, care for people while they're unwell. Um, but those who are unwell today or those who are in need of care are receiving that in the hospitals. They are staffed caring for those unwell patients. We have to acknowledge that we're only here because we've been pushed to this. We have been pushed to this occasion right now of being on strike. And there will be further strikes. But we have to acknowledge that we aren't here by choice and that we've done, not done this on an easy whim. This protest is not an isolated incident. You see, Britain is facing a winter of discontent. A gigantic wave of industrial action with strikes crippling the rail networks, the country's postal services, even airports. Look at these images. They're from December 9th. These are UK's Royal Mail workers. Protesting over pay and working conditions, they say they want a pay rise due to inflation. They're warning of a wave of pre-Christmas strikes. I mean, everything's going up in price, like, and then, like, they're offering us a city pay deal that doesn't, like, coincide with inflation at all. Like, um, so, sorry. So, um, like, yeah, I'm finding it really hard, like, to, like, heat my house, to feed my children. 
like you know just to live every day like as a normal person should like I work hard enough for it we all work hard enough for it like so we deserve a decent pay rise decent terms and conditions look at these images now they're from December 13th this is when UK's real workers went on strike the reason was the same soaring inflation and growing costs their warning too is the same a series of strikes in the run-up to Christmas. Well, we're sorry about the disruption. We don't want to have this disruption. We don't want our members on strike and losing their wages. Uh, but what they've got to understand, I think, is that the government is provoking this situation. Uh, they stop settlements and proposed settlements coming through. So I hope that the, the travelling public can stick with us and understand that our members have been put in an impossible position. But out of all of these strikes, it's the sight of nurses on picket lines. This will be the standout image for many Britons this winter. The NHS is the lifeline of UK's health system. It has developed the status of national treasure. By treating thousands of Britons free of cost, that too for over 106 years. Never in its history has the NHS witnessed industrial action on such a scale and the number of protesters could increase if their demands are not met. So what is the British government planning to do? Well, last we checked, it had refused to discuss raising salaries. This has only raised the prospects of more strikes. Bureau report, we on, world is one. Have you seen what's happening in Europe? It's a story which could very well be the movie plot of the next big heist, the great European heist. A few days ago on the show, we told you about the corruption scandal rocking the European Parliament. It's the worst scandal to hit Brussels in decades. And at the center of this scandal is senior Greek lawmaker Eva Kaili. You'd be familiar by this, you'd be familiar with this name by now. And this corruption saga is now getting more sordid every day. Let me catch you up with what's happened. What began with a simple extradition request from a Belgian prosecutor has uncovered a big scandal. The prosecutor was seeking to uncover whether Qatar and Morocco bought influence in the European Parliament. And what a can of worms it has opened. Raids were carried out. Four people were arrested. The most prominent name doing the rounds is this, Eva Kaili. She was one of 14 vice presidents of the parliament at the time of her arrest. She has been stripped of that role now. Both Qatar and Kaili have denied any wrongdoing. No surprises there. Who is Eva Kaili? Why has she now emerged as the face of the scandal? Because of her position and power, she's a Greek politician. She's also a former news presenter. She has a jet set lifestyle and has been in politics since a young age. She has been deeply involved in the EU's digital agenda, getting her hands on complex files such as artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and blockchain. So it's no wonder that she is making headlines for abusing all this power, abusing her office. And now, Morocco has been implicated in this scandal. A former Italian lawmaker has been found guilty of taking bribes from Morocco. Pierre Antonio Panzeri is the latest name to have come up in the international probe. The accusations were made in a search warrant. It was issued against Panzeri's wife, Maria. The warrant has been accessed by Western media. It states that Panzeri is suspected of accepting payment for intervening politically for the, benef for the benefit of Qatar and Morocco. It says there are indications that he had participated in a quote-unquote possible criminal organization with the knowledge and participation of his wife. What did they do? The couple allegedly spent $100,000 on a Christmas holiday with all expenses paid with a credit card belonging to a mysterious someone known as the giant. Like I said, it sounds like the grand European heist. The rot runs deep. More than 1.5 million euros in cash have been seized by authorities in the ongoing probe. The sordid tale of corruption, lies, deceit, is a big blow to the European Parliament's holier-than-thou image. You know what I'm talking about. It claims to be woke, preaching to the world about human rights. 
And now one of its most prominent faces is being accused of selling the blocks of Renty to Qatar. So what does the European Parliament have to say for itself? Well, as always, it has expressed concern over the graft scandal. It voted to call for representatives of Qatar to be temporarily barred from the legislature's premises. What does that mean? The European Parliament president is promising reform. Roberta Metzola says this scandal is a blow to democracy. She says there will be no impunity or sweeping under the carpet. She says the need of the hour is transparency. European leaders have entered the chat. Reactions are flying thick and fast. And here's what the French president had to say. I think that on these subjects, the justice system and all the services must do their job. We must base ourselves on facts that have been identified. The European Parliament is also doing its job. It's a very good thing to have transparency and exemplarity. We must do things in the right order afterwards. I think we need to know the facts, understand who is involved, and then take the appropriate measures. That's how I think about everything and we will make decisions. The competent institutions will make the appropriate decisions based on facts. Did you hear that? Macron says the European Parliament is doing its job. But is all this talk of transparency enough? Not at all. Such blatant abuse of office, of power, of the people's trust, should serve as an eye-opener for Europe. Its lawmakers stand accused of lobbying for Qatar of taking money from Qatar. Why? To influence European policy decisions in favor of Qatar, a nation which has been criticized for its record on human rights. You see the irony here. So next time the blog decides to lecture the world on foreign interference or give sermons on human rights, it should look inwards at the rot within. And remember that its own lawmakers can be bought by a wealthy country. Let's move on. A son is blaming Facebook for the death of his father. Facebook's parent company Meta has been sued. The allegations are that Facebook's algorithm help, helped fuel hate and violence during Ethiopia's civil war, which ended up killing the father, who was an ethnic Tigrayan. The man was shot dead on 3rd November last year. A year on, the son is demanding justice. He says that his father would still be alive if Facebook had just stopped the spread of hate on its platform and moderated its posts properly. Meareg's father faced ethnic slurs on Facebook. Users even called for his death. They slandered and revealed identifying information about him in their posts. Pretty much gave up his address. Meareg says that he immediately reported the posts using Facebook's reporting tool. But the company failed to save his father. It wasn't prompt enough. Despite repeated complaints, the posts were up until it was far too late. One was removed after his father's killing. Another remained online till about a week ago. Uh, I'm also stand up to say African lives matters. The way Facebook treats to uh, kids in the US or Europe should be applicable to Africans. So even though they are against, they say they are against racism, they are promoting racism by their acts, responses. So uh, that's also uh, my concern, and I hold Facebook directly, directly responsible for our father's or my father's murder. The plaintiffs want a compensation fund of $2 billion for victims of hate on Facebook. They are demanding changes to the platform's algorithm, and rightfully so. Critics say that Meta and other social media companies do not take any accountability for their actions. They do too little to prevent the spread of disinformation, of hate. Content promoting hate and incitement against various ethnic groups thrives on these platforms. I'm not exaggerating. And the companies are often too late to take it down. Some background now. The conflict in the region is between the Ethiopian government and forces in the northern Tigray region. But hundreds of thousands of people have paid the price with their lives. While platforms like Facebook just sat there doing nothing. 
Meta isn't facing such accusations for the first time. In 2021, a whistleblower, a former Facebook employee, made a shocking statement. She told the U.S. Senate that the platform's algorithm was fanning ethnic violence, adding that Facebook was allowing extreme sentiments to grow viral. According to her, Facebook was incompetent in identifying dangerous content. It lacks sufficient expertise in many local languages, including some spoken in Ethiopia. What's worse, the former employee said that Facebook promoted dangerous posts as they attracted high engagement. Basically, Facebook is trying to profit from hate, from hate crimes. Facebook clearly has not learnt any lessons from what happened in New Zealand. I'm referring to the Christchurch massacre. On the 15th of March in 2019, a black and white video was uploaded on Facebook. The video was part of a live stream in which a gunman shot down 51 people at two mosques in Christchurch. Two weeks after the harrowing incident, Facebook broke its silence. Its chief operating officer gave a written statement. She said the company was exploring placing restrictions. What restrictions? Hate still abounds on Facebook. People are still dying. Facebook has blood on its hands. Facebook's parent company Meta says it has invested heavily in moderation and tech to remove hate. Where are the results? Facebook says hate speech and incitement to violence are against the platform's rules. What is it doing then to rid the platform of deadly content? Facebook maintains that Ethiopia is a high priority when it comes to reducing hate speech. Well, if that really is true, a son would not have lost his father. Facebook has tough questions to answer and regulators around the world have a tough job in their hands and that is to bring Meta to the books and it is high time they do. As we end the show, let's talk science. NASA's spacecraft Juno is set to make its very first close encounter with the most volcanic place in the solar system. The Juno spacecraft has been orbiting Jupiter since 2016, but it is the first time that it will fly by Jupiter's moon, Io, at such a close distance. And this is just the beginning. Take a look. Jupiter's moon, Io, is the most volcanically active world in our solar system. What does that mean? Just as the name suggests, it is home to hundreds of volcanoes. Some of these volcanoes can send fountains of lava dozens of miles high. In July, NASA's spacecraft Juno captured a glowing infrared view of the I.O. This image was taken from a distance of 50,000 miles. The brightest spots correspond to the hottest temperatures on I.O. Juno is set to make nine close flybys of I.O. in one and a half years. Scientists will use the observations to learn more about Io's network of volcanoes. More importantly, they want to understand how its eruptions interact with Jupiter. The Io, however, is caught in a tug of war. Jupiter's massive gravity pulls the Io towards itself. But its two other moons, Europa and Ganymede, counter that pull. These forces cause Io's surface to bulge up and down as much as 100 meters. Juno's mission was to uncover more details about the giant planet, but since last year it's been passing by Jupiter's moons. This extended part of the mission is expected to last till the end of 2025. Juno's sensors were initially designed to study Jupiter, but they surprisingly performed a double duty of observing Jupiter's moons. Scientists say that with each close encounter, they've obtained a wealth of new information. The spacecraft flew by two other moons of Jupiter, which are of most interest for scientists. It passed Europa earlier this year and Ganymede in 2021. Juno managed to look beneath the icy crust of both the moons. It also gathered data about Europa's interior, where a salty ocean is thought to exist. This moon intrigues astrobiologists because of its potential for having a habitable zone. The data and images captured by Juno could help inform two separate missions in the next two years. This includes the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer and NASA's Europa Clipper mission. Jupiter's atmosphere is dominated by hundreds of cyclones and many cluster at the planet's poles. But the planet cannot be explored in isolation. 
its 80 moons, out of which 57 have been officially named, are thought to influence it significantly. And with that little slice of space, it's time now to wrap up Gravitas. Thanks for watching the show with me, Priyanka Sharma, leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Oh, oh, oh. Little one.